I believe you all heard the name Rockefeller if you clicked on this video. But what exactly do you know about him? Maybe the fact that he was one of the richest men in the world. Or that he was in oil industry. That's it. It is what I knew. But after reading one of the book on psychology, he was the example for one of the chapter. At the beginning, I was like, okay, he's in oil industry, got it. And by the end of it, I was like, wow, what a strategic thinking. One man that outplayed every competitor possible. That piqued my interest and I wanted to know more, dig deeper, so I did. That's how I ended up reading book Titan by Ron Chernow. This book still surprised me in so many ways. So I'm excited to share with you the most interesting part of his life, some lesson on business or approach to life that we can take from the book. All the chapters in this video will be in chronological order, so let's start with his childhood. The first 50 to 60 pages of the book all about his childhood, his parents, and the place where he grew up. But if I have to describe his childhood in one sentence, it will be hard times create strong men and good times create weak man, or in the words of author, John Rockefeller's upbringing would be fertile with cautionary figures of weak men gone astray. Yes, I expected that possibly he wasn't from the wealthiest or healthiest family, but his father was like too much. In every chapter, he never failed to surprise me how men can be so disgusting in the wild. To give you an example, he married his wife for money, then brought mistress second day after marriage, proceeds to have four children with two wives in two years years. Huh? Some years later, he married 17 years old while he himself being 42 and never divorced his first wife, also while being constantly absent from home and making a living out of some illegal stuff. I'll write in the comments more of the things he did, but I won't be talking about it in here because it will be 20 minutes only for the first part and how bad his father was. Now, what we know about John himself from the childhood. He was oldest siblings out of five and in constant absence of his father, he did uh, many housework plus farm work, so he was constantly doing some manual labor. I came back with some tea, cause who can in the middle of the summer get sick? Get me! John's mother also relied on him for emotional support, for help raising other four siblings and doing some housework. But if we will talk about his character, he was quite a hardworking kid who didn't like attention at all. And if you're curious why he didn't like the attention, well, because none of it was positive. Once again, because of his father. His father had way too many negative rumors and other kids and adults like to point fingers at him. Even he was just an innocent child who didn't do anything wrong and didn't have anything to do with his father's deeds. His mom, on the other hand, was strong and smart woman, even though stupid for marrying this freak. Sorry, I'm still not over it. She used to frequently say, we we'll let it simmer. And who was John not to use it constantly throughout all his career? We we'll let it simmer describe the best his decision-making process. Or he also liked to use the alternative, there is time to think and there is time to act. So he will think about every decision for hours, days, or weeks with no rush. But once the decision is made, nothing could stop him. He would move like the tsunami, sweeping everything out of the way. But he took all this time to think over a decision, not because he was unsure or indecisive. It's all because he took this time to create full-blown strategy, how this decision can play out in the future, not like in a few months or years, but probably for decades ahead. <laughs> Let's move on to his youth. When you hear when someone persistent or stubborn, what do you think? A person who never give up even when facing some failures? How many failures do you imagine? 5, 10, 20, more? But I believe there is hardly a person who can beat 16 years old John who was looking for, for his job. It's 1850s and you're a 16 year old country boy with some basic school education looking for a job in a big city. No one wanted to hire him. For about 3 months he would go from one door to another and ask for the job. And then the list of the companies will end and he will give up. Wait, it's not what he did. Instead of giving up, he started all over again, from one door to another. Some firms he was three times in three months asking for the job. I believe that 99.99% .99 of people would give up at this point and start to looking for some manual labor job that will be easier to find for a 16 year old boy. But all those rejections made him even more determined. He knew that money to be made was in one of those terms. Finally, with some luck and greediness for 
company owners, he was able to get the job. September 26th will be always honored as a job day, and John will celebrate it far more than his own birthday. Even at the age of 95, he tried to tell his grandson grand stories about his first job and told him, Oh, how blessed the young men are who have to struggle for a foundation and a beginning in life. You know that now everyone tells, don't give up, you need to face some rejection, you need to fail in order to succeed eventually. I think John took it to extreme and he was the prime example of how not to give up even when you are facing shit ton of rejections. This is one of the character traits that made him unique and it also the first time in the book when I thought, okay, maybe he did deserve it all. Now let's talk about the business. To start his first company alongside with two partners, John needed money. He did save enough at his first job as he was extremely frugal, but not enough for the growth and opportunities that was there if they had more money. And it's the middle of 19th century, it's super hard to borrow money just for anyone. You can go to any bank and say, hey, I need such and such sum of money, this is what I do have, like, give me some loan. No, it didn't work like that. So he turned to his Father. And Devil Bill didn't disappoint when he started to play some sadistic games with his son. I trade with the boys and skin them and I just beat them every time I can. I want to make them sharp. You know when you talk about beating your kids instead of helping them, right? Yeah, that's what he did. Later on that situation, Rockefeller would tell. Our relations on finances were a source of some anxiety to me and were not quite so humorous as they seem now as I look back on them. He would never know how angry I felt beneath the surface. I'd like to point out two words here, anxiety and anger. Even if Rockefeller ever felt such things, no one was able to tell it. His face was super stoic, there was no emotion at it, and no one was really able to tell his mood. He was mastered controlling his face, his emotion being super composed. The most calm and collected person ever. Something that I really need to learn from him, because I still struggle. Sometimes I just burst out of anger and it's not nice, but it's not as frequent as it was before, you know, the progress. Let's talk about Rockefeller's business growth. When you need capital for growing your business, what do you expect to give your partner? Sharing the company, maybe some executive position if they want it, but you definitely wouldn't expect your name to be dropped out of the company name, right? Then your new partner will get your place. And that's exactly what happened to Rockefeller. Did it hurt John's pride? Yes. Was it a low blow to his ego? Yes. Did he swallow it and stay quiet? Also yes. Now, but that doesn't mean he let it slide that easily. He was the youngest out of all partners and they thought he wasn't a threat. But surprise, they were so wrong about it. Long before I was 21 men called me, Mr. Rockefeller, life was a serious business to me when I was young. So this situation and his partner's lavish lifestyles was the reasons why John started to plan to throw them out of business. Before you say, huh, I knew he was the evil green. He didn't throw them out directly, but planned how to buy out their business share, also while making them believe it was their own decision and desire. Now let me throw in here one of the examples of their argument. George Gardner, you're the most extravagant young man I ever knew. The idea of a young man like you, just getting a start in life, owning an interest in a yacht, you're injuring your credit at the bank's your credit and mine. No, I won't go on your yacht. I don't even want to see it. Other arguments were about the loans. John liked to take them to grow the business, to acquire the biggest share of the market possible. He was a risk taker and he was a big believer in his company and in the business growth in the future. His partners weren't so much. Clark was an old grandmother and was scared to death because we owed money at the banks. So he used this knowledge as a tool to manipulate them and want to quit the business. If that's the way you want to do business, we'd better dissolve. Playing right in the Rockefeller trap. The next morning when they saw that John was serious about it, serious about dissolving, they were like, wait, are you serious? And he was like, yeah, I'm serious. I don't want to do business with you. The last part wasn't said, even though he probably did think like this. He paid a big price for his freedom. It was like $72,000, which in today's money will be $1.4 million. Now, at the age of 25, he was the biggest refinery in Cleveland and also one of the biggest in America itself. Now, let's briefly talk about Rockefeller's people. If the previous story made you believe that Rockefeller think no one was worthy to work with him, no one was as smart, could make such a good decision, you're wrong again. 
much of his career and his success really dedicated to the people he decided to surround himself with. It really helped that from the beginning John had really good ability to read people, read people emotion and intention. So he always ended up with the best of the best, especially for the role they supposed to do. It's also interesting once they got executive position at Standard Oil, it was like till the very end in the most cases. One of the first people John Rockefeller included was Henry Flagler. And you remember that I'm bad with pronouncing names, right? Henry perfectly completed John in the areas that he was the weakest. He was dealing with public affairs. John hated press, hated publicity. People who were too curious about his business, about his life, who spread some gossips about him, he never felt the need to correct them, even when they were obviously wrong. So that's where Flagler came in. He also was super good negotiator, which helped to create relationship with other big businesses in the area. Next chapter is rise to power. Many of Rockefeller haters will say that he climbed to power and extreme wealth through rebate or simply discount trade. Let's see what they all are about. Imagine that you are the biggest supplier of some product, so you do provide the most work and revenue to the logistic company that you are working with. You have the market power as their biggest partner. This is what gives you upper hand in negotiations, especially if there is like two other logistic companies who are perfectly capable of doing the same thing. Now you have two strong points in negotiations with your partner. And of course, if you want to make more money or to make your product cheaper, you will ask for a discount. That's basically what Rockefeller did with railroads, if we put it in simple words. They had better rates for almost all the time of their business. At that time in American history, there wasn't a law that prohibited such rebates, and everyone who was strongly judging him for it at that time would have done the same if they had the power. His competitors did try to get the rebate, did try to unite against standard oil, but nothing seems to work out for them in the end. To think about it, even if we leave behind non-existent law at the time, I don't even see anything morally wrong with it. That's basically economy of scale. The more products you buy, the cheaper it is. It's like everywhere on the market and it's still alive in so many industries. So I wouldn't say, oh, it was so unfair. Nobody stopped you from getting your base, from getting bigger market share so you will have the power to say something. As you see, I don't agree that rebates are solely responsible for his wealth. I'd rather say it's his strategic thinking, vision, risk-taking, being calm and collected in time of chaos that played far bigger role. When oil prices fluctuated from up and down, there was no stability on the market because there were too many competitors, but also on the other hand there was this fear that oil will run out, so the prices were super high, super low, no stability, and most of the time doing this business were unprofitable for all the companies. The invisible hand of free market economic concept that basically means free competition will be a good market regulator. Surprise, surprise, real business doesn't work exactly like in textbooks. The refineries were losing money and they still hold on to their companies for the longest time. Good question is why they did so. Well, because they did put a lot of money, a lot of capital into creating this refinery. It's not like some online business where you can start it with basically little to no investment. But in the oil business, capital heavy business, so to start you need to acquire a lot of capital, you need to buy a lot of assets. So if you close your company, it would mean you didn't only lose the money while selling product with the prices that was below margin rate, but you will also lose the money that you put into gaining these assets. So to lose some money now in hopes of getting big large profits in the future, what most refineries chosen in the end instead of just losing it all at once. Everyone was hoping and expecting that bad times will pass, but they didn't pass just like that and prices stayed super low, way below the margin rate of all of the producers. While Rockefeller tried to unite all the companies and simultaneously raise the prices so it will be profitable to work by giving quotas for each refinery so the market won't be overflowing with cheap oil, guess what? No one tried to stay within those quotas. They saw it as a quick big cash grab and tried to sell as much as possible 
resulting in prices going down again. It led to Rockefeller decision plus desire to unite everything under the standard oil. It also proved his belief that producers weren't the smartest people and they only care about getting quick cash to its profit instead of worrying about the future of the industry itself. Cleveland Massacre. Let's talk about it. That was the name for Rockefeller's takeover of the refinery business in Cleveland. In short, he bought almost all of his competitors by giving them either cash or company shares. He also was super upset when their partners will choose cash instead of shares because he did need to have this cash on hand to buy another refinery and the shares were a better decision for him at the moment. But almost no one was really going to take shares in Standard Oil, they were just going to take the money and it proved that those refineries didn't truly really believe in the future of the industry in oil refinery business if they just were happy to take the cash. Actually, I don't judge them here because I would probably took the cash as well. There was like no stability on the market, there was constant fear that oil ran out, no one really saw the future of the business as well as Rockefeller did in 10 or 20 years ahead. So he take over his competitor's business, some with good negotiation skills, some willingly sell to him getting rid of this unprofitable business and some by undercutting them with super low oil prices. I'd like to add in here that Rockefeller was really good at operations so he did have the lowest prices for producing oil. He would cut the final prices and it would be super unprofitable for other competitors. Two years after the Cleveland massacre, he did it all over the America. Ended up with 19% share of the market. This chapter is all about haters. It's honestly one of my favorite here. So Rockefeller for sure had many haters. They fell into a few categories, but the biggest one was refinery owners who took cash instead of his stocks and later regretted and then those who refused to sell to Standard Oil and ended up bankrupt as a result. These people did not want cooperation. They wanted competition. And when they got it, they didn't like it. Then one of the most famous hater was Ida Tarbell, some kind of journalist of the time. And guess what? Right, her father's company went bankrupt because he refused to sell to Rockefeller. And it really crushed him and he started to drink and turned into an alcoholic. So Ida Tarbell thought, Right, it's time to hate Rockefeller all my life. Like, really? So she was biased towards hating Rockefeller and she glorified every other man who tried to stand against Rockefeller who was his competitor or other hater. So every other refinery in her book was ready in joyous men who were crushed out by standard oil. Rockefeller was a venomous monster in the garden full of flowers. Like, really? But in fact, other producers, they weren't fighting for free competition, as they say. They just were jealous of Rockefeller's success and tried to create their own counter-conspiracy, tried to fight for their own rebate, but they weren't as successful as he was. There was no doubt they would have done the same if they had the brains for it. They weren't after the fair play, it just wasn't them who got it all. She wasn't representing both sides correctly and honestly, and that's all that matters to her. If you were against Rockefeller, you were the same. It really pisses me off in this book because the press, the journalists back then and even now, they just uh, really like to find the person to hate on, to get the biggest, the prettiest headlines and build their own career on hating on some people. You can say I don't really like most of the news reporters, I have my own reasons for it. Maybe in some other video I will tell you why, but now let's move on with our story. Get back to Ida. She tried to to consciously manipulate public view on Rockefeller, tried to make him some sort of the demon, when in fact he wasn't. He created with his own hands one of the biggest companies in America and provided good job conditions, good salaries for many people even in the times of depression when other companies weren't paying well and actually saving the economy at some point of depression by giving out loans for other companies that were on the verge of bankrupt. So much so that he provided money for GP Morgan because because he was also at the verge of collapse. And just like that, because of her father, she felt the right to portray Rockefeller as some sinister evil man. There was other big example of one of his haters who also lost his company because he refused to sell and he didn't win against Rockefeller. At every dinner meeting with friends, with different people, he always brought up Rockefeller, how he is smarter than him, just Rockefeller is more fly, so that's why he won, not because he was better. Haters in the book made me realize, oh my god, 
how pathetic it is to spend all of your life actively hating on somebody. Imagine living all of your life and when somebody asks what it was about, you say another man's name. So now I judge even harder those people who actively hate on celebrities, any famous person, without knowing them whatsoever. Now let's discuss what was the main negative thing about Rockefeller's company. All the negativity come from actually one place, that it was a monopoly. Or more like consideration, but for simplicity we'll use it like monopoly. What our economic textbook says the main problem with monopolies? That it doesn't in a way that it raises prices crazily and possibly employees' treatments aren't the greatest. Let's look at Standard Oil from this perspective. First thing first, it did innovate more than anyone in the industry and continued to do so even when it was a monopoly already. Rockefeller was such a penny pincher you would think he wouldn't try to look for the ways to make his product cheaper, to make the production cheaper. He also cared way more that he has shown ever about public opinion on his product, so he did try to make it better. Now about standard oil and prices. They say monopoly are able to manipulate prices whatever and however they want. That is but did Rockefeller actually use it to raise prices? While Standard Oil was operating, the gas prices actually really dropped to the lowest level it was ever. Yes, from time to time he used to raise or lower prices a bit to fight with existing competitors or to prevent somebody from entering the market. Actually, he brought some stability to the prices because before it was like up and down, up and down, there was no understanding if the price will be up tomorrow or if it will be down. Now about employee treatment. Of course it wasn't perfect like in any company, but it was still good. He wasn't some tyrant boss that everyone feared. First few years he accepted and welcomed any complaints from employee as a means to improve operation in the company and workflow. One biographer said about Rockefeller, he was the best employer of his time providing hospitalization and retirement pensions. The only thing he was strongly against is workers' corporations. Also the interesting part here, he was one of the first who started giving his employees shares of the company. I would have every man a capitalist, every man, woman, and child. I would have everyone save his earnings, not squander it. Own the industries, own the railroads, own the telegraph lines. So he really cared about his people and wanted to make them rich. Now, Rockefeller character. First, he was super ambitious, which is given, there is no denying to that. But there is also no explanation to it, I think he was born with it. Or maybe there is some reason, but we just don't know about it, and we will never know. Second, his discipline, belief, and faith was unmatched. He believed strongly that it was his life purpose to bring stability to the market, stability and prosperity. He was also super assured the best believer in his own company, in his own work. That's why he always bought more stock, also why he took crazy loans to develop the company. Much of his discipline, focus and belief came from religion. His father was happy-go-lucky charlatan and that turned John into religion even more. Rockefeller really believed in Baptist doctrine, never never touched alcohol, a cigarette, never went on dance, clubs, and all this Gilded Age entertainment was so far away from him, he never was interested in it. I guess he just tried to put as much difference between himself and his father as possible, and this was one of the ways. Instead, he believed in hard work, frugality, helping others, and God's mission on earth that was given to every man. He did work hard, but it didn't mean he worked long hours. He was actually retired in his 50s already, while he lived till 98. And even before retirement, Dennis, he was spending afternoons with his family instead of at the company. Now, one of his definitive quality was being super composed or emotionless, as people would say. But more importantly, collected in crisis. The more anxious and stressed others become, the more calmer he grew. Also, we have to admit that in addition to all these good qualities for the businessman, he was quite lucky as well. In Storm, his cargoes didn't sink like others. When he actually refused to get an insurance, he didn't die on a train that crashed badly. He was supposed to be on that train, but at the last moment he didn't go. He actually was born into the right place and the right time, just when the oil was discovered. So I'd like to add in here that Rockefeller wasn't just successful in his business, he also had good and stable family, he loved his wife and his children. John was good father and never shied away from taking care of his children, even though he was working and his wife didn't, and that's what most men used to throw away child care on the wife, saying it's 
her responsibility. She aren't doing much, so she better take care of the kid. He never did it. He was quite present father. He was the son of self-absorbed and absent father, so he made a point of being affectionate and present father. Also being a homebody really helped. Yes, I still did some mistakes while raising their children. They were a bit too strict to my liking. Every parent at some point made some mistakes while raising their kids because they also just regular people. The main point here is not to traumatize your kid too much like what Rockefeller's father did. Now let's talk about his retirement. After retiring in his 50s, he became more active with investing. Of course, he made a lot of money with Standard Oil, but it was the time to diversify. Rockefeller's name was a stock riser itself, but he still chose his investments really carefully not to blow away some money. Some investments didn't work out really well, but most of them were good because he chose safer options. He used to tell that I'm at that point in my life you know, in my retirement where I don't want to raise lots of money and maybe lose a lot. While still working through all the time and also in retirement, Rockefeller liked to help people and he believed that if you're making money, it is your duty to help those in need. But it didn't mean that Rockefeller was throwing money left and right, helping everyone and everybody. To him, the worst case of charity was just to give people money like in some cash and that's it. He believed it was really useful to work with the causes of the problem. Instead of giving alms to beggars, if anything can be done to remove the causes which lead to the existence of beggars, then something deeper and broader and more worthwhile will have been accomplished. So one of his first biggest projects was education for black women. At the time, they were heavily oppressed and didn't have the access to education and education later on can provide you with higher quality of life. Also as philanthropist, Rockefeller liked to create attachment from his creation. First he didn't like to put his name on his charities, like for example Carnegie did, he put his name on every charity that he did. Rockefeller didn't like it, so the university he was building didn't have his name at all. Also he believed that every institution that he was building has to be self-sufficient, not just relying purely on his money. And everyone who was proposing some charity was basically coming out to him and saying, let's build something and then all your life you will have to invest in it and we will be just sitting there and feeding off your money. It was a smart move to create distance and make independent those institutions that he was investing in. Because even without his name, even without his money, they were still able to survive on their own. So my conclusion on Rockefeller from the book that I read, by the way it's 700 pages, that Rockefeller did an incredible job at creating one of the biggest company, rewriting the whole industry in such short period of time. So he truly deserved the title, the highest genius for constructive organization in American history. He turned the case of oil market into a good controlled industry with lower prices, created workspace for so many Americans, cared about their prosperity as well, and also helped American economy and a lot of businesses to stand in the hard times when they were on the verge of bankruptcy. But US government as always played to the party was like, oh no, free competition, let's dissolve some under oil. Like now your market doesn't look like monopoly everywhere. Cool thing here though is that half of American anti-monopoly legislation are built and written on standard oil examples. In here Rockefeller helped US government because earlier there wasn't a monopoly to regulate. Of course you can build company of such scale completely 100% legally and without any morally questionable thing. But so is every big company that exists in history or exists even now. If you just type in Google or in YouTube, Nestle is a horrible company, Apple is a horrible company, and you will see articles or videos that explain that those companies were really horrendous, horrific, and still are, and guess what, nothing is done about it. But it doesn't mean that we should stick to the negative things and look out for the negative stuff in the book and say in the end, aha, uh -huh, he did this and this and this wrong. But my main takeaway from this book is that you yourself always choose what you focus on and what you decide to take from any lesson, any book, anything that you are doing. And it better be good things or some inspiration that you can use, something that doesn't conflict with your core principles. I actually believe if you are a business owner or you want to start your business someday in the future, you really need to read this book. There are just so many useful things you can take away from it. I didn't call 
cover everything because this video would be four hours long because I took so many notes while reading it. All in all, Rockefeller genuinely surprised me in a positive way. Even though in most cases I have like preset, pre-made respect for people who build something big on their own without any outside help. It's really inspiring for me to look to such stories, read more and learn about the person who stands behind it all. I also hope you can see such stories as a way for inspiration, not looking for something to hate. Rockefeller wasn't just the richest man, he was truly one of the kind character. So if you have time and you like historic books, highly recommend you to read it all yourself. Now stay healthy and happy, bye bye!